So, good evening, and thanks for coming. And I, I'm going to make my talk shorter than what I planned, because I think in this past week, and I think in this past few months, a lot of us have a lot of things going in our heads, in our minds, and we were sort of so sure that America was going to some direction, and certain things are not shouldn't be happening, certain things shouldn't be public, less public. And I think a lot of us have a lot of uh, confusion. And so I'd like to make my talk shorter if there will be questions and we could have a conversation. And if there's not, then I'll just continue. So um, I'd like to, quote, to start with a quote. There is no private domain of a person's life that is not political. And there's no political issue that is not ultimately personal. And I think Tzniut is a lens that can teach us a lot, both about the public and private realms of our life in general, and of our religious lives in particular. So religious expressions often share an animosity towards so-called mainstream Western society, framing their critique in terms of what they perceive as a breakdown of traditional values, family values, norms, and respect. Nowhere is this critique sharper than issues of sexuality, and in particular, the public display of women's bodies. <coughs> For women, this often involves exhortations from our authorities to accept and or reaffirm their roles as sexual gatekeepers with rhetoric running the spectrum from how wonderful the unique feminine sanctity that requires hiddenness to appeals to take responsibility for the spiritual well-being of their male counterparts to threats of punishment, both this and otherworldly, if rigorous modesty standards are not upheld. The claim is often heard that Western society only wants to undress, <coughs> only wants to undress its women so that they can be made available for the pleasure of men. And indeed, this criticism resonates deeply with much feminist cultural analysis. Traditional religions often present themselves as an alternative to this culture as a place of resistance to Western imperialism and a safe haven. They claim to neutralize the West's obsession with women's bodies and focus instead on the person in her koliyutu, I can say. In response to the West's undressing of women, traditional religions urge women to cover up and reclaim what has been taken from them, a lost sense of honor, dignity, and integrity. This discourse operates under the general heading of modesty. In analyzing how modesty is framed in preparing this class, I went through some new materials and in the Catholic magazines I found the wonderful quote called modest is hottest. <laughs> what exactly it is intended to represent much can be learned from underlying ideologies regarding women, men, and relation between the sexes. So despite being framed as the antithesis of Western values, one need not even do a close examination of the discourse to observe that in fact a lot of religious discourse and even practice, rather than subverting dominant discourse, preserves precisely those elements with which it claims to be at war. It's presented as a return to integrity, it seems and it often feels to women as actually stripping them of even the most basic bodily integrity 
constructing them as a collection of parts. The essentials, a pervasive male gaze. And here, from the beginning, I'd like to make the distinction between a male gaze and the gaze of men. It is not the same thing at all. This male gaze, I would say, hurts men, real men, as much as it hurts women. And I hope that we can get to talk about it. Compulsively speaking about women's bodies in nearly infinite detail, many who are reading this start feeling boy. So that the changes it makes are ultimately, from any substantive perspective, and certainly from the perspectives of the women upon which its authority exerts force, are really just slightly cosmetically different. Now, how did I come to be thinking about this, and where do I come from in this conversation? I've done and taught many courses on adolescent sexuality and have done a lot of research since on programs of sex education, what is often called in some of the film schools in Israel, Chinuch Lechayei Mishpacha, or in short, the Oive curriculum, what are we going to do? Our students have bodies. <laughs> I've compared it to many of the curriculum in the Catholic schools, and I've lately also gone over what is being taught in the Arab schools, particularly in the north of Israel. And much of these programs talk about modesty, talk about covering, talk, and there seems to be like this kind of entwining of all these, of all these, what, of all these in the one hand, respectful conversations, and on the other hand, things that really feel off. Actually, almost pornography. So, and so much of the research of modesty is about covering and not covering. Who is covering? Who is, who is telling who to cover? And who is watching who? I was a teacher in a religious girls' high school for quite a few years, where the topic of what to say to the girls, who is going to say, how should we say, was one of the most talked about subjects in the teacher's room. I've been invited to speak in umpteen teacher's rooms in so many schools in Israel and here to try to talk about something we're not supposed to talk about, but yet we have to talk about it. And can we speak? Who can say what? Can we just say to someone, and in some schools they would like to say, please come to school dressed. <laughs> now, everyone seems to be at a loss, and everyone cannot stop <clears throat> speaking on how they are at a loss and are questioning themselves, why do we care so much, but we really do care? And is something wrong with us that we care? And what is silencing everybody? I was an adolescent girl in a religion, in a Haredi girls high school, where the principal would feel our legs in the morning to make sure we were wearing stockings and that we were not lying and we were just suntan. And so as you can imagine, many of us felt that something was really off. We didn't have a language for saying something is really wrong. I ended up not going to high school after that and I just stayed home and sort of worked with my father and my mother and different things. I'm a mother of three daughters, nine of our And I experienced it when my girls were going to school. The principals would always say, you know, that we have to talk to your parents about how you're coming to school and how you shouldn't come to school. 
And most parents said, like, why are you speaking to us? Why do you assume that we are part of this and should be part of this conversation? If our kids are not listening to you in school, they certainly are not going to listen to what we have to say to them. So, um, but on the other hand, there's something else that I learned. And that is that if we don't speak to our children, they will not know what we think about. The notion of the mother tongue, that just if our kids are next to us, they will know, has been, I mean, I've showed it at both with, in relation to Catholic girls and their mothers, and Orthodox Jewish girls and mothers, that if we do not speak, they will not know what we really think. So I was someone who was involved in starting shul in Yerushalayim, Shira Hadashah. And I remember so many times the Gabayim coming and running up to me and saying, Topa, what are we going to do? Don't you see this woman came into shul sleeveless? And so like I was looking for this. Why, first of all, why are you looking? <laughs> you know, and it's like, what are you looking at other people? And, and so what? And then they say, but what will they say about us? Oh, so I'd say, if anybody's going to say about us, they'll say that someone came to Shul sleepless. <laughs> and you know what else they might say? And, but you know what she might say? Is that if we said for Chavez, she might even come back next week. <laughs> and hope, I used to say, Let's really hope that she's going to come back next job as the Davin because we welcomed her. But the anxiety, you know, that it just, there was this pervasive anxiety about how do we appear if someone is dressed differently. Now, so one needs to say that this anxious conversation is truly what we call an embodied conversation. I am also a person in this culture, besides being a mother and, you know, in the, I'm an individual. Reading now what's going on in America, reading what's going on in Israel, I sort of have come to some place deciding that I think the Mashiach, the definition of Yimot, a Mashiach will be when powerful people stop relating to a little less powerful people like the pieces of Google. I think that's like the basic, a sort of like a basic thing, and it really is Yemot HaMashiach. But I don't even think we're in a Kalka Tegulva yet. So I'd like to, for a little bit of time now, talk about some of the terms that I think um, in, in, our, in the religious Jewish context that describe or can help us understand perhaps how did we get from there to here? How did we get from this idea that Hatznei Lechet Im Hashem Elokecha and I'd like you to keep thinking of it as Im Hashem Elokecha. The with part is what, something that I'd like you to think about. Not under Hashem Elokecha, the with Hashem Elokecha. <coughs> How did we get from that to where we are now? And um, and I think I'm don't, I'm not a biblical scholar, but apparently the translation of Hatzne is not humble, and it's, it just became afterwards used that way. But it actually it doesn't even mean and walk humbly. God is a, a mistake in translation. It means more walk carefully with God as they do the comparison, but that's what. So one of the parts of Tzniu has to do with covering. We have to cover ourselves. And as you'll see, covering, I would like to relate to three different parts of covering. Covering because one is sinful, covering because there's shame, and covering to protect others. And that other is usually what I would call Shimshon Dinesh. In Reshi Rava, I now will quote, why does the man go out bareheaded but the woman with her head covered? 
He said to them, it is like one who has committed a sin and he is ashamed in front of others, therefore she goes out covered. The Midrash is taken from a list in which the sin re referred to is the sin of causing Adam to eat from the tree of good and evil. This interpretive tradition extends the shame of Eve's original act to all women throughout all time. And in doing so, transforms it into an essential condition of womanhood. Whatever quality caused Eve to sin, and whatever consequence the sin exacted upon her ontology, lives on in her female progeny like a dominant spiritual gene. For if the sin of Eve is not merely a historical fact of her, but a live present threat in constant danger of being reenacted, then suffice it is to say that sinners must be covered. Another paradigm that for centuries served as an anchor for the justification of keeping women covered equated the female as a sexual temptress of luring men to arousal, and, uh, <clears throat> and it really was their fault. A more nuanced development of this, equally destructive, both for men and for women, is that women should cover themselves, girls should cover themselves, because men cannot control their desires, which, I'm, which is why I call them not Shem Shal the Ibor, but Shem Shal the Nebesh. Woman looms as a potential source of pollution and disorder whose life and impact on men must be regulated. So cover up, says this gaze, so that I will not be led into sinful thoughts and actions. So once this premise is accepted, it only follows that the entirety of female energy in the realm of Sniut goes towards protecting men from their sexual fantasies. Women who by rights, by the way, should be grateful at having been passed over this sad affliction. This comparison is basically, they have desire, so you cover yourself. What you feel, need, and experience is not even part of that conversation. So we are all there to help men not feel sexually aroused and then not sin. So that men also, in this kind of conversation, why it creates such a lopsided discourse. So instead of dedicating their resources of time and energy inward, basically they fix their gaze outward and that the full-time job of managing male sexuality has been displaced onto women. So given this background, it's not surprising why the vast majority of this new literature is towards women. So in that sense, women have and are continuously based objects. And the question of how do you then walk the world as an object becomes very confusing. And how do you walk with God as an object becomes very confusing. So what this has and what does this do for women's self-image, what does this do for men, for boys, what does this do in the relationship between sexes is very, I think, very destructive. And in fact, so many programs in schools, and here I'd like to say mostly the ones that I studied were in religious girls' schools and in some of the Arab schools, is 
it is our responsibility to make sure that the boys and the men do not sit. And if they do, we did something. We are guilty. Um, and, and I'm just going to repeat the story that I then had heard and sort of I'd become known for my little story on Rogola. But it was so, it was so, um, it was so vivid that I, and I see here not that many people know it, so I will repeat it. And that is that one of the women in the Midrasha uh, explained to me that a young man, or just told me what happened, that a young male teacher, before giving his evening lecture, placed a, pole, a bowl of rogalaf in the center of the table. And as the girls reached for the rogalaf, he said, wait, wait till the end of the, um, end of the shiur. So at the end, when the girls finally began to take a knee, he said, remember how distracted you were by those rogalaf? That's exactly how I feel when you don't dress modestly. At first, I honestly didn't believe that it was happening, but it really did happen. So that in that sense, women are and a whole other supporting cast of mothers, daughters, girlfriends, sisters, wives, are drafted into the service of boys, of regulating boys' sexuality. And it's up to them to continue to regulate it. And I think, I mean, I don't just think, I know that this has done some also really crappy things to boys and as they grow up to be men. I think many boys get confused what happens if they don't see women as a lot. When does description of boys' weaknesses become a prescription of what malehood ought to be? Um, I think that there is another issue of women being covered, which is something that I think it's important that we all think about. And that is that we often think that if our girls are covered, they will be protected from the influence of Western male gaze. So at least you can say, okay, we are, we walk the world with bitachon. We walk the girl, we walk the world <laughs> feeling not just feeling safe, feeling from, feeling, you know, that we have our integrity, that we can really look about, look onto our pnimiyut and all these things. And again, I have, um, I've done extensive research with Shatchaniot in the Haredi community, and I continue to be, I continue to be in relationship with them because it's, they're a really fabulous source of explaining to me what's going on and what are people talking about. And that is that boys and young men come to the Shatchaniot and, uh, And they ask the Shat Khanit to please find a woman with Midot. And as you can know, Midot Kalte Mashka. And the amount of the rise of eating disorders in the Haredi community <coughs> of young women is really now epidemic. And um, my colleague Esther Altman, is, who works here with Haredi women, and my colleagues in Israel who work on the Haredi war, on the wards of eating disorders, they're the fastest growing population of young girls eating disorders. And between the time between Pesach 
and they come home from seminary. Or as soon as they come home, there's like literally a period of starvation. And mothers and the girl, they put off shit up times for the three months in order to starve so that they will look attractive enough for their potential Benzu who will. So what's really very hurtful is that even when we thought when we thought that we can cover our girls and our girls that will be protected if we're doing it in that, we just actually have to know that this is one of the areas that that Western gaze, just like it's like you know that powerful kind of being, because it really undresses everybody. I don't think that that's an amazing interfaith experience. Everybody's suffering from that gaze. Now, I. Um, I would like to talk about another aspect, not only of covering, and that's the aspect of marginalization. One of my best friends in the past 10 years is Hannah. I've played with her a lot, talked to her a lot. If any of you would like to begin that conversation also, you can begin Samuel 1, chapter 1. And who is Hannah, and why am I always talking to her? I'm not crazy. Hannah is a woman who says no to her husband, who refuses to swallow that prayer. She cannot literally swallow the prayer after her husband says to her, I'm as good as 10 kids. So she realizes that when he had gone to pray, he really didn't have her in his prayer. What does she do? She goes to the Mishkan, right? She doesn't stay at home, sit under the table. She davens, but where does she daven? She, she davens in Rishut Haravim. The priest tells her what? What does the priest tell her? Your prayer is not recognizable to me, and since it's not recognizable to me, something obviously is wrong with you, and you are drunk. Right? And then, you know, she explains to him, and he does tshuva, and that may be one of the reasons why we read it on Rosh Hashanah. I think because actually it's a case where deep tshuva occurs with Eli. And then the Gemara makes out of Hannah the symbol of prayer. But, she, but it doesn't only keep her as the symbol of prayer. There's another stage in it. And that is that she becomes the woman who can say to the who can say to the priest, if you can't understand me, and if your religious imagination cannot contain another way of davening, then you are not a man of God. Right? And she is that she critiques the blindness of a narrow religious imagination. I mean, it's an incredible sugya in the second prophet, how they bring her to be critiquing the priest, critiquing Hashem. She's an, I mean, they take her to such um, levels. And so we have this, and I talk to her a lot. But <clears throat> who is Hannah in much of centrist orthodox literature in the last 50 years? She's used to critique women's prayer services by Rabbi Tversky. She is used 
to critique women's smicha. She is used to critique any religious activity of women me'ever the reshut hayachid. It's an incredible case where the Gemara is so bold, and there's a case of a woman who's davening, but she doesn't daven like everybody, but she becomes the symbol then for all davening, where just like three words are taken, she davens quietly. Now instead of saying, and in the Gemara she davens this way, which is everybody should daven this way. And instead, in the conversation that is used against religious women's inclusion and development, all of a sudden, don't you see? Chana was quiet. Therefore, you women should be quiet. Don't you see? Chana was so modest. We never, if you look through, Herschel Schachter's chumas. We never, we men never have to daven out loud. But you, you can do it quietly. And it's not only you can do it quietly, therefore you ought to do it quietly. So I would like the issue of sanua in terms of being marginalized, being quiet means marginalized. Being quiet means you may not have a religious voice. And for all those who think that, you know, we have this about women's issues, I think it's good for us to look sometimes and see how even some of our religious heroes or religious sheroes become so silenced in the conversation about modesty. And again, when description becomes prescription, how twisted things can become. Now, one of the things that I would, um, an interesting example as well was in the 16th century, the Rav Mashash brings it. I learned it from, it's not my, again, my own scholarship. I learned it with my Chaguta, David Piton, who works with me and is now heading the Department of Jewish Studies in Ono, where I teach. And there was a woman in Algeria in the 16th century who lamed. She went completely veiled, and there were everybody veiled. She veiled like the women of the Muslim women, and she had, and there they only had one slit, not two, she had one slit. And so she used the lane, and she had a beautiful voice, it says. And so the men, because they couldn't see who she was, kept on guessing, who is she, who is she, who is she? So because she was so covered, the conversation was not a very sensible conversation and they were halishing to know who she was. And since then, because they couldn't figure out who she was and it bothered them, then they gave, made a takana that women can no longer, that she could no longer leave. Because it bothered the men because she was so tsanua. You, you want to go like this? That's one of those stories. So again, it, um, I would like to stop in five minutes and have some questions, but I'd like to think of, I would like to just talk about two other terms that we use when we speak about sniut and what we speak about in feminist theory about women covering, and we use something that is very difficult, I think, and it's called, we do false consciousness slash empowerment. Now, what is false consciousness? Does anybody sort of know, want to try to try to say something or try? Okay. 
Okay. Um, it's, a, it's an academic concept that suggests that people think that they're being empowered, they're actually being repressed. It's my, Plus. It's my, it's my go at it. Yeah. Okay, it's, a go, it's fine. It's not only an academic, right. but it's, oh, it's, it's Marx. Right. That's what actually, it's, Marx okay. talked about false consciousness. And that is that, let us just say, the people feel happy and they don't really know that they're really enslaved. Right? So Marx uses it in the context of the, of the Pauline. You know, basically all the proletariat really makes a mistake and doesn't understand that they're all, that if they're their friends, their fellow workers are the ones that should that's their community and mistakenly really see their bosses as their people they want to be friendly with or that they need. And they live in a, a false sense of who is who are with them, who are against them. Let's just leave it at that. It's a little more complicated, obviously. And in order to have the revolution, we, the people have to move from false consciousness to a different kind of consciousness. So we, in a lot of feminist literature, or analysis, and now I'd say of the religious worlds, of the various religious worlds, the assumption is that women live in false consciousness about how oppressed they really are. And the answer, but I'm happy, right? My, my cousin Adel, you know, has 18 children and is happy. And all of, my, all of us should be as happy as she is. So what is our role? How do we, first of all, how do we listen to her experience of happiness? And then what is our role, let's say, as teachers? Do we want to shift people who are happy in what they, in how they experience themselves and tell them, you think that you're happy, but I want to tell you something. You shouldn't be so happy. Come suffer with us. <laughs> and the understanding, though, of Marx is that this false consciousness will never bring about the revolution. So which, in that sense, when Lenin in Russia realized that the proletariat weren't with him, he shifted the term of false consciousness and said, hey, it, even if the workers don't realize it yet, it's enough that a small group of us We'll know it, and then we will do what? We will feel it for everybody, and then we will start the revolution, and then the dangerous part is, and those who don't get it will be sent to Siberia and will be re-educated. So that process of re-education is something that I want us to think about. So in much feminist literature, when they talk about women's modesty or the way women's bodies are treated in our culture, in the cultures that they live in, whether it's this religion or that religion, they don't really know how oppressed they are. And that's something I want us to think about because it's very confusing. It's very confusing that is there oppression or isn't there oppression? And is oppression in that sense an objective term? And therefore we have to help people understand that they're being oppressed? Or, or it really is everybody just feels what they feel. And you know, we do a hinema tovamanan and we kind of try to make a place for those who don't want to live that way. So I would like us to think about that. And then I'd also like us to think about the term empowerment, which is one of those overused words also. And what does that mean? I'd like us also to think about the term of choice. The idea that we read, and now I'm gonna refer to some of the work on Muslim women, but I'd like us, I think we're all part of this world and I think it affects all of us. 
And that is there's a group of women who say, out of choice, I am covering myself. Now, what is the meaning of that choice? And I am covering myself. This is my identity. This is my, again, my war with, with the West. The West is doing this to our I am choosing. I am an empowered woman. And I am choosing my identity. And I am choosing to be covered. Is that just OK for all of us? Now, I'm not talking about us as being the judges, and I don't mean it. I'm saying, what does that mean? And, and I'm going to push that. Does it make a difference if when I choose to do X, in some way, I have to know that others are forced to do that? And does that make a difference in the discourse? Because that is also something that is going on in the discourse of modesty in general. In other words, if I am choosing to do something, and I know that many other people are forced to do it, and if they don't, they will either be killed, they will either be beaten, certainly sent away, does, does that make a difference in how I speak about my own choice. I um, would like to just finish this part with um, two things. And that is, I would like to go back to what I started and say, what does that mean, Matzmei Lechet Im Hashem Elokecha? What does that mean to be with God? And then it's a call on each and every one of us. It's not a communal call. Very often there's different ways of, you know, of, of giving tzivui and talking. Everybody do this. But what does that mean? to walk with God. And what does that mean that it doesn't that we don't walk under God? That we as individuals can walk with God. We are called to walk with God. And I'd like us to think about it and I'd like to stop now and take some questions and then So we'll, I'll take a few questions. So first of all, thank you so much. This has been great. Um, you've given me a lot of things that I shouldn't think about when I'm getting dressed in the morning, but I'm wondering what you think I, I should be taking into consideration. What you should be thinking about? Anything? I'd like to take a few questions and then I'll. Um, I thank you. I know you were called on to give a critique of the youth and the uh, surrounding it, and I appreciated all of your comments. Um, but I guess my question is kind of similar to the first one, which is, what then do you do with the body of halakha that was created from the mentality of Horishi Graba or? Um, and not the Gemara about Hana. So again, to say it again. <laughs> um, now that you've kind of looked at the underside of Smeut and the way that it's kind of been constructed and the legalism around it, what then, how then do you approach this body of Halakha that was created in that environment in the present day? this is a question exactly, but I want to highlight a conflict that I think you illustrated really well. Um, I'm a psychologist and I took a course on domestic violence. And one of the things I learned in the course is that when a woman is in an abusive relationship 
and people decide that they are going to get her out, they are going to make her leave, they may think that they're empowering her, but they're actually doing the opposite. And I think I appreciate your sensitivity in pointing out that while we may think somebody who's covered is being oppressed and disempowered, sure. when we try to raise their consciousness, we may be making the mistake of imposing our view on them and not letting them decide. I was hoping you could talk a little more, Cynthia, about what a day school environment looks like that has a productive conversation and a productive policy around modesty. And it's also sort of like the language that educators can use in dealing with those issues. Okay, I'm going to stop now and then we'll do the next week so that I can okay. So, um, I think um, Karen Hornay speaks uh, a psychoanalyst in the 30s introduced a term that I think is very helpful. And that's a term she calls the tyranny of the shoulds. And I, um, I think we can sort of try, like when we ever we use the word should, we should just think about it a little more and say, it's not that I think that therefore we should live in a world without shoulds. That certainly is not what I'm advocating. But I think that when we use the term, like when I teach my graduate students, when I teach methodology, and how do we listen to people's interviews about many different things, one of the things that I learned from Karen Barnai that I try to teach my students is any time in the narrative that you've interviewed, the word should comes, what comes after that? No, I shouldn't let, when I was interviewing mothers, at, religious mothers, Catholic and Orthodox mothers of adolescent girls who are also teachers of, of adolescent girls, I heard so often the mother feeling jealous that my daughter likes her Gathering up this whole list of what were the shoulds, I was thinking, like, where did you learn these shoulds? And how, and why shouldn't you feel jealous of your teacher about everything and says nothing to you? Like, why do we have to say, so, I, I you know, I don't want to say what you should or shouldn't address. Like, and I don't want to know what to say, what your, you know, what are the, but I think, what are, you know, could be the directions. You should do this, you could go to here, to there, to this, not, you know, whatever it is that we, or, this color, not this color, which style, which not style. One of the things I think we that could be helpful is that there's many shulchan aruchs about how to get dressed. You know what I mean? One, you know, there's, and there's many of them. And so I think that sometimes it might be helpful to start saying, okay, we have Vogue magazine or whatever the newer ones are. There's those dictates of how we should look and what do we wear to this and where do we, you know. There's so many of them. I think that if you're, we're even a, begin to be aware of how many shoulds there are in this conversation, you know, from A to Z, I think just that acknowledgement might give us a little bit of rest. And uh, okay, and I'm willing to, you know, so now you're asking me what happens if Reishi Brava is louder than the Gemara of Chana, than the Sechet Brachot. So in a lot of my work that I've tried to do, you know, and a lot of people, you know, would ask me, and I ask myself, you know, why do I stay? Why do I continue having this conversation with myself, with the text? What is it? I mean, why don't we just, we, in whatever form, who felt oppressed in A, B, C, or E, just say, you know something? Okay, we know it had its purpose, but we have to leave. One of the best books I've read, and I suggest that you read it because it's a very beautiful book, 
by Daphne Hansen on feminist theology. She was um, an Anglican, um, a woman, uh, she taught, she had her doctorate in theology, and she trained Anglican ministers. For 12 years, she begged to be ordained. She was, you know, teaching the men as they were, and then they still were not ordaining women. They started to, but since then they were. And after 12 years, she gives up on Christianity. And she actually, in that book, I think in the first chapter and a half, has the best reasons for why to leave. And really, in a sense, basically makes out of me mincemeat. She really, I mean, it's just, there's, you know, moral, from every aspect, she's clear, and I really suggest you read it. A, really an incredible articulation of a deeply religious woman who says Zell. There is no more reinterpreting. And that, I understand that. Though if you read her next book called After Christianity, someone who was a very religious woman who tried to make in some way yesh me'ayin, how the creation of what she tried to do is very thin in that sense. So what do we do when Chana has become marginalized in some way and Breshi Graba in our experience is screaming? And that is the dominant. Now, I, do, I actually take the term that I learned, it wasn't my term, Bell Hooks' term from margin to center. Another book I suggest you read. And I hope I don't sound too teacherly, telling you what I think maybe you might want to read. I don't want to use the word should. Sorry. And that is these voices, Hannah's voice is a hushed voice. There is no doubt that when you look at the sugya and you read it and see how she has developed, I mean, it becomes even more incredible because in that sugya, and that's what it has to come to, she, or that sugya, she, or how she's been used, is in some sense a countertext to the sugya in Mesechet Sota. In Mesechet Sota, why don't we teach women, why? The conversation about whether we should or shouldn't teach women learning is about what? Come on. What's it about? What? Come on. You want to try? I said whether they'll die in the Whether they'll die in what? In the Sota ritual? Yeah. No, so it's not whether they'll die in the Sota ritual. It's about. It's that that the sugya comes with the sense that if a woman, in fact, behavior was not okay, and she had an affair with someone, even if she gets, even if someone gives her, the, she goes through the sota ritual and drinks, if she does, if she does a mitzvah, then the punishment gets, it stops for a little while. And so the problem then is, what should they do? Should, if women are not taught, then what might happen? Then they they had an affair, and then they get stuck the next day, and they went to do the, the sota ritual, and nothing happens to her, then what? Then she'll think what? That it's really okay to have affairs. On the other hand, what will happen if we teach her that, then she'll have the what? The trick. Have an affair at night and go get stuck in the morning and you will never die. Okay, that's a kind of bizarre way to relate to women's learning. Okay. What do you have with Hannah? Hannah knows that halacha. 
And what does she do in the Gemara there? She says to God, if you do not help me get pregnant, then what I will do, and she quotes sort of like she will quote the, the Tanakh on that, I will go and lehit yached, I will have yichud with somebody, I won't do anything, but I will then force you, God, to act upon what it says in the Torah, and that is, and then you will go, as they say, as the Torah says it, you are really innocent, you will then go and get, you know, either get pregnant or you were pregnant, it doesn't matter. So the Chana ritual here, Chana also even says, I have knowledge, and guess how I'm using my knowledge? In your, this kaka head, from a Sechet Sotah, knowledge is used to how I will have an affair. No, I, know, I do have knowledge, and guess what? And guess how I use my knowledge? To be a mother. Now, so that whole sugya is very, as you're right, very marginal in the larger conversation about women, women's bodies, covering, not covering. And there's no doubt that Reishi Brava, it also, you know, Christianity, I mean, there's a lot, it's very, very loud. But what I would ask is, is Chana part of the system or not? And when we say that she is part of the system, we're not saying that she is the loudest part of the system. We're not saying that she, it's, that is really the system, all the rest are just little stuff. We're very aware of all the other noise, of all the other values, of all the other oppressions. But the question is, can we move we stand again at Sinai. Can we move Hana from being on the margin to becoming more sentient? That's the question that we all have to make for ourselves. Is the system possible? And there are many who are going to say, you know, Tova, it really isn't. I've been smashed through so many areas, taking and putting together these few little pieces really doesn't do it for me. And that happens all the time. What is the price of giving that up? And then, you know, as people say, okay, so that's great, so you move from there to go. But, you know what I mean, it's not, it's how do we resist things that we know are off? Can we connect to other pieces? And what might be the price of that? And that only each of each of us as individuals or the kinds of communities we want to build can answer. Um, for me, when I, I left studying Jewish studies, after studying for many years, mostly with my father, Zippo Holy Bracha. That's basically, I left the Haredi school, that's all I did for 10 years, because I just studied all the time. And, the, and then I started, I was a teacher in a religious girls school, and I really felt I couldn't do it anymore. I could, Mela, I couldn't for myself. I could not, with good faith, socialize from girls into this system. It just, I, it was too much for me. And it was just, the truth, I told this one too much, it was just so hurtful. I felt hurt in myself, and I felt I was hurting others. And I felt the learning was, it just, it just, I couldn't do it. I didn't want to do it anymore. I felt I was being dishonest. And I left. I left for really a long time. I never really, I never left, you know, doing 
mitzvahs. It was like becoming secular just wasn't so much my thing. I mean, I don't think I get any school because I don't think I can swallow trade. It just doesn't even. I think I would just, you know. But it just it was okay. That's how I lived. Do you know what I mean? But I wasn't involved in socializing anybody else. I didn't. It was none of that. And I thought, you know what? I'll go into psychology. Adolescent issues. I can sit and listen to adolescent issues, parental, so I thought that would be a neutral space for me where I wouldn't hurt so badly. And then what happens, lo and behold, like you leave Ellie the coin, you come to Freud, the, the, the secular priest. You know, that deep understanding, and that's why I was talking, is that the deep understanding that feminism did not come about because there were some problems with the sugya of modesty in the Gemara. I mean, there's, it really, it reflects something so much larger, so much larger than, than this piece or that piece. And I have to say, you know, and I thank, and I always quote here my teacher, Carol Gilligan, who I was going to do my thesis on some notion, because I came from philosophy before, on choice, some sense of choice in feminist theory. And it was she who told me, Tova, Go back to Jerusalem, go back to orthodoxy, and do some research. And she said, and this is what I'd like to wish you all, she said, where you have your questions, you'll do your best work. And I thank her, because she innate, I mean in a deep sense, that I did go back, and then it helped me say, you know what? I'm gonna start, maybe we'll start to get a shul. Maybe we'll start some other things. And that's um, now, I think that your comment on how do we liberate people and how do we empower people is a very um, is very nuanced. It's it has many pieces to it. I think when someone's in an abusive relationship and it was being abused, and we get to know about it. Obviously, the first thing to do is not to say, okay, you leave. Guess, for, you know, for even the most important reason, why? Because usually women who leave are the women who get murdered. So basically, if you want to protect abused women, help them stay in their abusive relationships because they often get murdered. Women do not get murdered mostly in their abusive relationships. But, and that should teach us when you know we come with all the great solutions after all this and say, well, why aren't you leaving? <laughs> Guess what? I learned something. I know something. So that's something else. But the idea that when we have the solution, as it, we don't always have the solution. We really don't have the solution. And when we look at one very thin piece of a solution, it so is not the solution. And the, I always think that the bracha that we always say as therapists, the same bracha as we say as doctors, when we really have to know we're not God, <coughs> is so important. And yet when someone does come, though, being abused, one of our jobs is, yes, to begin to explore the possibility that you don't have to be abused. <coughs> and we do have to help her understand that it's not that she burnt the cholent, and if she lost 10 pounds or gained 10 pounds, that she has any control of the situation. And one of the things I think that's the most important things when we work with couples and families and women who are abused, it is to release them from the notion that they have any control over the abuse. And we know that we can never do couples theory, couples counseling, when there is a situation of abuse. And there has to be, someone has to take ownership of the abuse, and then you can start working on the relationship. And it's not, well, you know, I made him angry because I lost weight, and now I look pretty, and then he beat me up, so maybe if I gain back my weight, and then I will, you know, to understand that you really don't have power in a situation of that. And I think that is what, you know, but that we are gonna come with our great little shelter for five minutes, don't you see? We open the door. Well, is not the um, is not the solution. But I think there's a difference between 
though it may not be certain, you know, between abuse and uh, sneeze. Okay. Now your question is, so what can it, what can a room look like, a teacher's room look like, in a conversation about? And what's your question? In a conversation about what? About sneeze? About dress? How they should? How they should talk to their students. How they should talk to their students. What I would like those teachers to first do is to have a conversation with each other about how they should look. I think that this issue is so complicated for us as adults, for me as a grandma, for you as an adult, that I think that we make a mistake when we think we can skip over how we feel and then go say, well, I think we can talk to kids about X. Unless we're really aware of all the tyranny of the shoulds that have to do with body, with modesty, with sexuality, with halacha in it, and this whole, there's many, many pieces. And I think that we, it won't work being a teacher of others until we actually have that serious conversation with ourselves and with each other. There's men and women and, and women with women and men with men in the teacher's room. And I'm not saying this because I don't want to answer your question. But what I'm saying is that it won't work. Because the issue is not, then what should we talk about to our students? I mean, I as a mother of girls had three, my older daughter, I was told how many times as I call, well, the boys in class can't concentrate. She's in a school in the Rova because she's, she, looked, she looks too pretty. Okay, I can't believe I'm getting this conversation. I don't believe it. But then my other friend, whose daughter's in Fairweather in Boston, got the same call. So I said, okay, the Rova there. Nobody's got it. But I really do think that just like when we say, okay, how am I going to teach the kids to daven if I'm not davening? Or if I have such struggles with God, what should I share? What shouldn't I? What do I say? Well, and I think that that honest conversation about what is it like to be a man who in many of these conversations I'm guilty until proven innocent of being a, a pervert. Why is that whole conversation about Sinyut making me into Shimshon the Nebish? Guess what? I'm not. I resent it. Men can say, what is this? So I really would encourage a conversation with the teachers about their own shoulds, about their own struggles. And when that, that comes in a real way, it's very interesting how the teaching becomes different, and the teaching becomes nuanced. And all of a sudden, we look, we find new sources to share. And some will come with, with the decision that they don't want to speak to the kids at all about it. Actually, there's a few ulpanas in Israel, in the Shtach, like very, very from, that have decided they never speak about Sinyut ever anymore. There's two, there's like a, sort of like an underground, of saying we stopped speaking. I think someone, and when you and the teachers begin to remember what it was like when you were talked to, what was effective, that's the conversation, and what was humiliating, and what worked. So it's obvious, you know, the school that I went to was not in a great degem, and I, you know, checked out. But did anything ever work for you? For the women in the room, for you as, to, if it worked, Yofi, and if it, nothing worked, then you need to start thinking about together. And I really do think that that will create a totally different conversation. And I, here I might say, I'm, I know I'm in the very minority. I usually suggest uniforms, by the way. I'm a big chassidah. Uniforms, even though everybody says, oh my god, our creativity. I says, be creative, wear a bow in your hair. I love uniforms because I'm also, I really, I work with people of many different economic classes and it just 
everybody, and even though there's, you know, those who will have 10 t-shirts at the school and those who will have two, it really does make a difference in equalizing. And so I also think the whole issue of tzniyut is not only, you know, what is covered, but really, and I think that that, and I, I get such flack from everybody about all of a sudden what happens to the kids' creativity. I said, first give them some creativity with crayons, mm -hmm. give them creativity with other things, and break, break that economic burden and such the disparity of everybody. So, but that's just, I but that's a little thing. The deeper thing is how do we, how do you as a teacher, and it's the question where I ask in my book, where am I in relation to the traditions I am passing on? And that question, to keep that question alive in the teacher's room is very important. I remember in the women's teacher, I mean, when we were women teaching women, most women didn't daven every day, and then they're running to stop davening on everybody. Okay, you know, this, it's not, why have you stopped davening? And now what kind of voice are you going to use to tell people to daven? It just, so I really think that question, where am I in relation to the traditions I am passing? And where am I in relation to adolescence? my own adolescence, what do I remember? And that will shift a lot of the conversation. I um, now you had a question. I remember there were a few other I, questions. I, 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 I want to, uh, just going back to source, thank you. Just going back to sources, it seems to me how we, we focus on sources as you mentioned that the problem about Harvard's uh, Activity as being a paradigm uh, uh, as far as uh, attempting other. What about Hobbes activity in adding growth? Do you see that as something um, which characterizes some aspects of, um, of acculturation of women in, in some cultures or subcultures? In fact, that, as you know, uh, God said to Adam, simply don't eat. And she added, when the Nachash repeated those words, and not to touch. And that, of course, so that there's no yeah. punishment. And so any, any thoughts about that? How that would perhaps, um, in, in, in the, um, in the sense the of- The doesn't bring to all these such great endings. Okay, so, about that. Yeah, okay. I'll try to I, mean, I, I know you're trying to get away from Mahabha's activities being emblematic for, for womankind throughout the generations, but there is something that she shifted. That? Okay. That, 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 okay. Are we, we need to finish that? Am I not? Okay, I just want to make sure that I can. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the so recently done Catholic communities and Muslim yes. communities. Um, can you reflect, I guess, both as a scholar and like as, 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 a, as a Jew um, on the usefulness or non-usefulness of those kinds of comparisons? Yeah. You know, I'll regular that. Okay. Comparison. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, you spent a while critiquing different parts of like the more right-wing Iranian approach. Um, yeah. I've spent a while critiquing the more right-wing Khareini approach, so I'm wondering if there's anything you think of value that comes out of that approach. Of the Khareini approach? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Swallow the money. Small. <laughs> 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 
voracious for a lot, it's like the 300 or 500. The ideas, with, the ideas with an affirmation, with Kaba desiring knowledge, with um, everything is, is the woman being equal, being an Ezer connector. What happened to the Jewish aspect? It seems to me this original sin is kind of Christian. Um, I'm going to start with you because I don't have an answer, that's the truth, about the text um, adding something that she added a focus. So I. I, I what, what I'm getting at is in, in other cultures too, you have the Catholic mother who was dying oh, for okay. oh. a priest. So oh, that's so something whole, else. That's a, so what, that's what I. Um, so in that sense, you know, it was women who said they wanted the Sheva Nikki. There's many ways of ha what extra chumras women take upon themselves. That's, okay, that's, yes. Women do take upon chumras. But not only do they, in what way they're activists, but I, the specific thing I don't know enough. I agree that not necessarily, that covering is not per se a negative thing at all. You know, and I think that sneers per se is not a negative thing at all. The question is, who is looking, how it's being talked about, what is the covering that's going on, and what is the discussion about the covering? And in some ways, when I, and it's not stuff that I use the modest is hottest kind of thing, because then is it like, the, is it that, or it's just modest, it's like, it's okay, it's good to cover some things. And it's your covering because that's the way you want to walk the world. And the covering is that there is something, I mean, we didn't speak about Kedusha now, and that's a whole other conversation about Kedusha, but that there's value. There's real value in covering. And I'm sorry if in any way it, you heard that I think that there is not a value in that. Okay. I am questioning the kind of conversation that takes place so much in the covering. And who is telling who to cover and how to cover is something else. Now, okay. The, um, the relationship of Catholics, Muslims, and the comparison, I'll get to one second, the Haredi approach. So is there any value in the Haredi approach? First of all, there's a lot of value in a lot of the Haredi approach to a lot. One of the things I think is something that we should, we can all learn from, is that in the Haredi approach to clothing and to dress, there's basically equality between men and women. And so that it is not a community that the women are all covered and the men are walking around with shorts and Mickey Mouse t-shirts. In that sense, there is serious equality between the call to walk in that way covered as a tzias method. And that's one of the things sometimes I ask in the discourse on the covering and on that. Is it that I have to cover because I'm going to, or is there something about covering as we walk the world? Every individual walks the world with Hashem, and it's not only because her, she needs to cover me, and I think that sometimes I use that as the litmus test when I compare cultures or compare things or ask the question, who else? is being called upon to, to dress this way. I mean, we're using the term dress now, but, and these other kinds of things. And so I do take a lot. I mean, I learn a lot from the Haredi world, and, learn, and working in the Haredi world also, I really do question the notions of false consciousness, and in that sense, it's a very important conversation for me and for other people. Can I listen? You know, in feminism, one of the things we always teach in feminist theory and methodology is how not to overvoice the women that you're interviewing. Because up till now, you know, male 
voice dominated their conversations and they interpreted them. Okay, so we come to there and then we hear women saying, I feel good. Then I say, oh no, you don't really. And I think it's a very important lesson is to listen to how people are describing their lives without analyzing it from other kinds of perspectives. The comparison with Catholics and Muslims and other religions and other ways of, I mean, I think we live in the world. We live in a world where we are deeply influenced and in conversation with other religions. So if, you know, if the Rav Mashash brings in the what happened in Algeria, and he talks about the woman being covered, veiled, sometimes it also may give us a little sense, you know, what does something mean to be quote unquote Jewish? And what's something about them? And very often, as I mean in my work with Catholics, Mary and Miriam, we could basically, Mary starts the sentence and Miriam finishes it. Because some of the experiences are so deep. I generally think we can learn from other people. That's just, that's just that thing. Do you know what I mean? That I just, and I love to learn from people. So I think there's a lot of value. But there's also, there's a lot of value because I think in the conversation, not only do we see how similar we are, it's also okay to see in what areas we're different. And it's usually kinds of Venn diagrams, right? You know, like the, those different places. And uh, it just is how do we live listening and keeping our own identity. I think it's a lot of value. And I think the question though now, that it relates to what you said, about is the sin Christian? Is Breshi Rabba Christian or is it really Jewish? What's very interesting for, uh, I would say when I first was involved in, oh, it's my <laughs> is that when I, I first started becoming involved in feminist theory and then going to some conferences, I, for a while, could not go to Christian feminist conferences because so much of the language there and the rhetoric was, in Jesus we were equal and it's the rabbis and it's rabbinic influence on Christianity that made Christianity so misogynist. It was, but it, so it was, and it wasn't like in one thing or the other, it was a real, like a deep, Thread that way. It wasn't like a thread, I'd say. It was like lots of fabric going through. So the idea who influenced who is something that I think we should just all take responsibility for what we do and for our sources. It's interesting in terms of source criticism to look and see, okay, there's this, there's that, interesting. But Breshi Graba was given to us and it was written in a language, you know, our mama Lushen. And of course it was influenced by others. Of course it was. The idea that any of us think that we're not influenced is, uh, I will send you if you want an article I wrote on shuvas about homosexuality. And where I made the distinction between the psak halacha, whatever it is they come, and from the whole rhetoric around it. And one of the things I would claim there is that, what I claim there is that rabbis who used homophobic language, not, this, not the final thing in Tara Sur, I would claim that they assimilated into the homophobic culture in which they lived. So I think though that we all have to take responsibility for what we take from other cultures, for what we say. And in terms of scholarship, it's nice to know there was this, they said this, and they said that. But if it's something that we really, um, we've written, and not only have we written it, we dub in it in Kabbalah Shabbat. Like, we had to add this also? Like, we had to add these, do you know what I mean? So. I think we just need to take responsibility for what we do, how we do it, and to say if we don't want to do it, just say enough. 
Okay. So I wanted to thank you.